on on day 2 of this sttp so for today dr shri vallabha devi will be deliberating on reinforcement learning so over to you sir uh, thank you very much sir ma'am uh, so if we can switch back uh, to the yeah can you see my screen ma'am all of you yes sir okay yeah so good afternoon uh, participants and uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you again uh, today i will uh, be talking about reinforcement learning this will be a basic introduction what we do or what reinforcement learning is about and uh, and i'll i'll uh, we'll have a hands on session at the end of the talk so this is the outline uh, there will there will be a brief introduction of reinforcement learning and then we will not we'll move on to understand the concept uh, so think of it uh, i mean the best example for a reinforcement learning use case is a computer game let us say we are trying to develop a computer game that people will play so all of us are familiar with lot of games maybe uh, when we were uh, kind of children we had super mario and now there is there are lot of other games like uh, pubg and a lot of things that are there already we know that uh, that is that gaming itself is a big industry now let us just for a moment imagine we want to devise or we want to program or develop a computer game how do we do or what do we do now the simplest game is tic tac toe uh, all of us might have played it in school where you play it's also called dots and crosses so there is a three cross three board and one per one player will put zeros and one player will put crosses so it's called the dots and crosses uh, and any player will win if writing a program a computer program which will play tic tac toe with a human being suppose you want to do that is it very difficult no it is very simple meaning you can you can easily evaluate what is the winning position or if the opponent or if the human player plays something you know what else to play because you only have nine squares or nine nine uh, options to choose from then uh, all of you are familiar with computer chess as well you can play chess on the computer as well as on the mobile so computer chess the programming space or the number of uh possibilities will increase it is not very very easy to uh, write all the rules for playing a game of chess so for for the for playing a game of tic tac toe the rules are easy if the first player puts a circle there you either choose a cross in the center or you choose a cross in the opposite center something like that you do so you can enumerate given the scenario you can uh, you can see what all scenarios are possible and you can write rules for them that is what you can do very easily in tic tac toe but the moment you go to chess the number of boxes and the number of pawns will are so many that the rules are writing rules will become very difficult then the the other game is alpha uh, the other game is go this is a, a game uh, from the east uh, japan china somewhere where people try to encircle the opponent so white white uh, uh, play, player with white coins and player with black coins play and they try to encircle the opponent if you encircle the opponent you will win you place the uh, coins on the uh, junctions of the lines so in this game the number of positions are even uh, even higher than the game of chess chess is simply 8 cross 8 or 64 square whereas here you will have even more number of positions that are possible and each position will have three options you can either have a white player or a black player or a empty space so these are the number of possible possibilities that you see if you want to write or develop a game or write a program for playing the game of alpha go now now we will see what happens if you want to do the tic tac toe game it will be a college assignment most of your uh, students in your colleges can uh, easily write a code either in python or c++ to play a game of tic tac toe if you see uh, the game of chess a computer being able to beat a human being happened only in the 1997 so it might look like very far away from far behind us 97 is like 23 years behind but still it was uh, computers have been there since 1940s and 50s so from 40s 50s to 97 itself is a long time so a computer being able to beat a human being in the game of chess happened only in 97 uh, almost like 30 40 years after computers came into vogue and the computer be beating a human being in the game of go happened very recently 4 years ago in uh, when google's alphago google had a google has a super computer called deepmind they they developed a player called alphago which is a computer program so this program was able to defeat the world champion lee sadol in 2016 so 
so this is not very far away this is only 4 years ago now if all these are computer games each one can be programmed or each one can be something that you write a code and you can win why did it take so long from 97 to 2016 to win the game of go that is that depends upon the game complexity so as we progress from tic tac toe to chess to the alpha go the complexity of the game increases what do we mean by complexity complexity is number of positions possible and number of uh, pawns or things you can put in each position so in the case of tic tac toe the complexity is this you only have nine squares or nine boxes and in each of these box you can you can have three options which is either a dot or a cross or empty so there are only 27 spaces possible meaning the board can only have 27 variants if you go to chess in the game of chess what do you see in the game of chess you see that there are 64 squares and each side has eight different uh, not eight the king the minister are two unique pieces and then three uh, pieces of uh, uh, camel and the horse and bishop or the uh, or the elephant and one pawn so 1 plus 4 plus 2 six every, every player has six distinct pieces and there are 64 squares so in each of this square any of this piece can be there literally in the chess board so you have 64 into 6 that is the number of spaces possible it is it may look simple but it is difficult to enumerate again uh, and then if you go to alpha go the number of possible combinations become even larger uh, sorry i just uh, uh, gave a wrong calculation for the game of tic tac toe each option, each position has three possibilities so it is 3 to the power 9 it is not 9 into 3 the first box can be either dot or cross or empty second box can be dot or cross or empty so it is 3 to the power of 9 that is the number of combinations that are possible in tic tac toe in the game of chess each square has two uh, each square has 12 possibilities it can be white pawns it can be black pawns there are six distinct white pawns and there are six distinct black pawns so 12 to the power of 64 is the number of combinations in chess and if you go to alpha go the combinations become even too many so we cannot when the combinations are possibilities become too many the problem is we cannot enumerate them by enumerating meaning we cannot list out all of them by listing out if the first player plays a zero on the corner what to do do you have it covered do you have did you, did you write a, a code for that condition if the if the starting player's position is zero what to do do you have a rule if you are able to write a rule that is called enumerating the rule now if there are 100 rules for your computer program to win against a human being you should write conditions for all these 100 rules or you should enumerate all the 100 rules if the rules become 1000 10000 and all it becomes humanly impossible you cannot really foresee all those scenarios and you cannot write conditions to uh, uh, conditions uh, for the player to play computer you cannot tell the computer do this or do that the other complication is even if you are able to enumerate all the rules each position may have multiple options so let us say the first player started with a zero here and the computer is playing a cross where should i play the place the cross should i place it in the middle should i place it in this corner sorry should i place it in this lower right corner or should i place it in the top corner each position itself has its own chance of winning you may have more chances of losing if you place your cross in the middle versus placing the cross somewhere else so that kind of understanding doesn't come from enumerating the rules if this is there you have multiple options which option to take you still don't know you have to find out somehow these are the two difficulties when you try to go and write a program to play a computer game the more complicated the game is the more difficult it is for you to write a reasonable program so if this is the case how do people write computer games or how are they able to write chess games which are so that is where reinforcement learning is used predominantly there are other applications of reinforcement learning as well but the computer games is one of the most popular or well known option or well known uh, uh, area so there what does reinforcement learning do reinforcement learning will teach best actions to a software agent so by software agent we we think of we can consider it to be the computer program that we are writing so there is a program you teach it the best actions what are the actions and what we will see what are these when are these actions to be taken in different states or situations by state or situation we mean the position on the tic tac toe board so if the first player started with a zero in the left top left corner 
that is one situation versus the player starting with the zero in the center so these are two different situations your program must be able to take the best action in both of these situations or how many our situations that will come up during the course of playing the game and in an environment what is an environment we will see shortly to maximize the cumulative reward what is the cumulative reward the cumulative reward for a program is winning on the human being because games are like you play you win you get a point you don't win you get you don't get any points so the way people write the games are to make sure that the game will win whatever the human will do the game has to or the program has to make sure it will win reasonable number of times so that is what is called as maximizing the cumulative reward so this is a simple schematic of what is happening when we say agent our agent is essentially the software program it need not really be a physical robo but it can be a software program which will take an action given a particular state it will take an action the environment will look at the action assess it and then it will give you a reward the observer will look at the action you have taken on the environment and give you a reward most of the time this observer also can be a computer program it need not be that you manually say i will give you a chocolate or don't give you a chocolate it can be a computer program giving a positive reward or a negative reward the positive reward is what the agent will be trying to look for a negative reward is what the agent will be trying to avoid it was it doesn't want to go into a place where it gets negative reward so this is what reinforcement learning is about and we will see more more uh, detailed explanation so i have been talking about environment state and action what are they so if you think of the game of tic tac toe our environment is a game of tic tac toe if you think of chess environment is a chess board with the pawns included okay and then the human player in this case let us say plays o and zero or the dot and the computer play a computer or the agent will play cross then then what are states states are different configurations of the board the configuration meaning the board is empty is one state the starting state state zero and some player plays a zero here that is one state the other player plays a cross this becomes a different state so every position of the board or every configuration of the board is a state what is what do we mean by configuration configuration is the arrangement of pawns on the board so this state in the middle state i is different from state k because there is an additional zero if the additional zero was here it would have been a different state and not state k so why do we need states states are basically identifiers for the board configuration so that the computer program will learn to take suitable action very simply put state is like an id for the configuration of the board if the zero is here and x is here you have one number to identify and if the zero is here and the x is somewhere else you have a different number to identify that is all what a state is about now what are actions actions are what the computer player will do we will see what are the different types of actions that are possible in the case of tic tac toe but why did we choose tic tac toe primarily because it is a simple game with minimal rules don't there are no there are no complications like the elephant can only move in straight lines and the horse can only do a l type jump these are all not there it is only simple rules you choose to pick place a symbol dot or a cross in a particular box that is the only decision you take which box should i place the cross in that is a simple decision you take so minimal rules and it is easy to evaluate the board state if somebody is going to win or winning it is very easy to evaluate you can do that in chess also but the evaluation in chess will come after a long time very long time and in the case of tic tac toe the strategies that you can choose are simple what are the three strategies that you can choose we can play randomly we can play aggressively by when we say we we are referring to the computer program that we are writing the computer program can choose to play randomly whatever the other guy does it will do something okay that is what you see in the middle the first player played as o here you put a x here the computer program put a x on the top right corner then the other player put a zero here if the computer program is agnostic or doesn't really care about what the other guy is doing it will play randomly what will it do it may choose to place a cross here which you know is useless because the other side is already blocked you can never win the tic tac toe also the other player can complete his zero here and can win the play game of tic tac toe so the computer program can choose to play randomly where your chances of winning will be very very small it can choose to play aggressively by aggressive we mean it will only try to win again i won't really care about what the other guy is doing i will try to win so if i if the computer program is trying to win the first zero was here the second x came here and the second zero came here what will the program do the program will realize i cannot win on this side because this all this row is already blocked so let me switch to column and populate an x here 
So for the computer program with an aggressive strategy, this looks to be fine. But again, you know that the other player can complete a zero and win. And the last strategy it can choose is to block. If the other player is going to win, you block. That is what you should do. So don't worry about you winning. You first prevent the loss. Let the other player not win. That is what you can do. So these are the three strategies you can choose. Choose one of them in a given state. Choose one of the strategies and play. So that is why we choose a game of tic tac toe as a simple demonstration or an experiment to talk about reinforcement learning. So any questions? Uh, please feel free to ask. Uh, no problem. We can take uh, any questions that may come up. Please raise hands or maybe I'll pause somewhere in between for the question. Then. Then what are the actions in a state? How do I know or how does the player or how does the game know what to do? Given a state, given a situation that the board is in, we need to take an action. So if you go back one slide, simply to say, if the state is like this, there is a O here, there is a cross here, there is a O here again, what action should the computer program take? That is the question that we are trying to answer. So given a state, let us say the board is in state K, what is the best thing for the computer program to do so that it will win? It will win not immediately, but maybe after a few more moves. Okay. So win or loss can be, evaluation is easy for simple games. And the win or loss can be very easily, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, evaluated from the current state. You know the current state, you can very easily say who is going to win or who is going to lose. So coming back to our example here, you very well know that by the time you are in this configuration of the board, the other player has won or you have lost. It is very easy to evaluate this. But in the game of chess, if you make a different move, it is not easy to evaluate. It will be, it will take a lot of time for you to evaluate who will win or who will lose. And the best action can be articulated and coded. So even without going into reinforcement learning, if I know what are the possible combinations, the possible combinations can simply be coded. You can write code saying that if this is the board state, do this. If this is a board state, do this. You can write a set of lines of code. And the code will make sure you win all the time. That is very easy to do. But this will become difficult as the game complexity increases. Meaning, if I then tell you, okay, fine, your tic-tac-toe code is very good. Can you write the code for chess? Then the problem will become very, very difficult because you know that the states are too many. There are not few states, but there are a lot of states that are, that are there that you need to code for. So it becomes impossible or all states and rules cannot be enumerated. Meaning, you cannot think of every possible configuration of the chessboard and then write a rule for how does the player behave in that configuration. We cannot do that humanly or human being. It is very difficult to evaluate. That is when we will switch to what is called as Monte Carlo simulation. We will couple Monte Carlo simulations with reinforcement learning to learn. What are Monte Carlo simulations? I will talk about it briefly. Very simply put, Monte Carlo simulations is playing the game enough number of times to cover all the scenarios. Which is to say, if I play the game of chess 100 times, I will know most of what will happen. If I play it 1000 times, I will even know, I will even know more better than what will happen when I play 100 times. And if I play 10,000 times, I will know it reasonably even than most other players in the world. So you play the game, repeatedly play the game with an opponent so that you see different possible configurations and you will learn to behave. You will learn what should I do in such a configuration? That is what Monte Carlo simulations is about. One simple example for Monte Carlo simulation is finding the value of pi. Pi we know is the ratio of the circle circumference to the radius of the circle. So 2 pi r is the circumference of the circle and uh, sorry, pi is basically the ratio of this uh, is a uh, diameter to the circumference. So the circumference is 2 pi r or pi d where d is the diameter of the circle. So, in using a computer program, we can estimate the value of pi. So, from basic math, we know pi value is 3.142. But if I say you don't know the value of pi, can you estimate using a computer program? There is a very, very interesting experiment or demonstration on Wikipedia. You can go and look at it. Monte Carlo estimation of pi. How do we do that? Uh, the program is there online. You can read it up. But I will simply describe how do we do. So, if you don't have any access to any mathematical book, or you don't know the formula, or you don't know the evaluated value of pi, how do you calculate the value of pi? You take a simple example. You take a square of side 1. So 0 to 1, 0 to 1. Side 1 meaning length is 1, breadth is 1, or length and height, all sides are equal. So there is a square of side 1. In the square, you draw a quarter circle. Basically, you draw a circle of radius 1. 
the radius of the circle is 1 so you draw a circle you see that your circle will be a pink line that is what you are seeing right now right so imagine that you have a imaginary circle in the square now now write a program to generate pairs of random numbers between 0 and 1 by pairs i mean we need to generate two numbers x comma y x is a random number between 0 and 1 and y is also a random number between 0 and 1 you can also imagine in the physical sense you can imagine it to be you are throwing darts at a board there is a square board in front of you you are throwing darts onto the square board dart is some pointed arrow which will go and stick to the board so you are throwing darts onto the square board let us say you throw a lot of darts and then how do you estimate the value of pi you estimate the value of pi from basic algebra you know that area of the circle is pi r square area of the quarter circle is 1 by 4 into pi into r square so pi is something you don't know yet but 1 by 4 into pi into r square r is known to you 1 by 4 into pi into r square is the area of the quarter circle and the area of the square is r square r is the side of the square area of the square is r square so the ratio of the proportion of dots that fall inside the this area where x comma y are such that x square plus y square is less than or equal to 1 for each x and y i evaluate x square plus y square under root which is the distance from the origin if the distance is less than 1 it is inside the circle if the distance is more than 1 it is outside the circle that you know anyway so you evaluate the proportion of points which lie inside the circle to the proportion of total points so if there are 1000 points 3000 points you throw you will see that some of them fall inside the circle and some of them fall outside the circle how many fall inside the circle it is given by 1 by 4 pi r square how many fall outside is given by r square the ratio is simply pi by 4 so pi by 4 would be equal to something that you will see in this count if you count how many are inside versus how many are total you will get an estimate for the value of pi by 4 so pi is simply 4 times that now why am i telling you something about uh, uh, pi value estimation the way that we estimate the pi value is by generating the random number so if you see here we have generated 3000 random numbers 3000 x comma y pairs and then try to estimate the value of pi so when i generate 3000 pairs i see how many pairs are such that the distance is less than one by the total number of pairs which is 3000 and that fraction is equal to pi by 4 from there i come to the value of pi that is all we are doing now when i do that we see the estimation of pi value to be, to be 3.11 we know the true value is 3.14 or somewhere so what do we do we do we generate more points now just simply instead of doing the experiment for 3000 times do the experiment for 10000 times what is the experiment the experiment is simply generating random x comma y pairs take a arbitrary x value take a random y value between 0 1 and then say this is the point that is all the experiment is about now we generate 10000 pairs you see the pi value estimate becomes 3.1468 and you generate more pairs it becomes 3.15 if you generate more pairs, it will be something else. But asymptotically, as you keep generating more and more pairs, it will go close to 3.142. This is a very, very simple example of Monte Carlo simulation. I don't know anything about the process. I will generate random numbers and then use some basic understanding to estimate what I want. This is simply a Monte Carlo simulation in a nutshell. Now, how do we use Monte Carlo simulation for doing our uh, this thing? Uh, for doing our uh, yeah, somebody raised their hand. PMF, I see. Go on, go on, sir or madam. Hello, sir. <laughs> sir, what will be the distribution of uh, random numbers when you are generating random numbers using particular solution? Yeah, yeah, these are uh, uniform random numbers, madam. Usually, unless we know something about the process, we generate uniform random numbers. That is what will give us this answer. You set it to be close to so with a Gaussian, you will never, we can never estimate the correct value of that. Okay, sir. Yeah. Uh, uh, any other questions? No, sir. Thank you. Yeah, sure, ma'am. Okay, okay. Then we will move on. So going to the next slide. Now we saw how we can use Monte Carlo simulations to estimate the value of pi. How can I use Monte Carlo to do reinforcement learning or do training for my particular game? If I want to play tic tac toe, how do I use Monte Carlo to do that? That is what we will see. So when we do Monte Carlo simulation, something will happen. How do I capture the learning? Learning meaning my game needs to train. 
how do i capture the training that is what we are going to see now in this case of pi value estimation we know simply that the the ratio of number of points inside the circle to the total number of points is an estimate for pi by 4 but in the case of tic tac toe you will do you will play the game n number of times there are lot of random states that come in how do we capture or how do we take the learning from there is what we will for different applications whatever i do it should not be only limited to say uh, tic tac toe if i if i come up with a theory that this is how i will capture the learning that theory must be generalizable to different games if i replace tic tac toe with a game of chess it should still hold and if i replace chess with alpha go also it should still hold so how do we capture that so there is a there is a uh, concept called state action reward matrix this is basically the thing that will capture all the learnings from a reinforcement learning training so there is a state and within the state you have some actions that you can take and each action will have a reward that is what we will try so what is the state action reward matrix we will see now let us go back to the original example that we saw so there is a human player playing circles or dots and there is a computer player playing cross so the board is like this the human player played a zero on the top left corner computer put a cross on the top right corner then the human player put a zero on the second row on the second row in the left so this is like if you index the cell 0 0 or 1 1 1 1 1 2 1 3 2 1 2 1 the human player will put a zero now given this scenario the computer can take many actions it can put an x here it can put an x here it can put an x here and there are also three more i am not showing it can put one more x here one more x here one more x here so there are basically 1 2 3 4 5 6 states possible six actions possible by action i mean choose the cell into which i put my cross now among all these actions you know that one of the action is useful for you which is action 2 and the others are useless because whatever you do whatever other action you take the human player will win so ideally if the computer is in state j you should know or the computer should know that i should i should take action 2 and not action 1 or action 3 how do we make the computer learn that <clears throat> that comes from this so we set up a matrix called as a state action and a reward matrix in this state these are all the actions that are possible now how do i get the numbers inside the numbers inside come from monte carlo training we will not put any numbers because we don't know we will start with zeros everywhere we will play the game as the game progresses somebody will win or lose based on what actions the agent took in a particular state you will win or lose suppose the agent took action 1 it is like this the, the board state is at state j the agent said put a circle put a cross here which is action 1 and eventually the game went on to the game went on so that the human player won or the computer lost so if the computer did this action and it lost it will learn to understand that this is a low reward so by reward we mean what is the probability of winning or very simply put it can be thought of as a probability of winning and then the computer will realize soon that if i keep doing this in this state j i will lose so the state action reward matrix will learn the value of 0.1 similarly the other state action 3 also there is no scope of winning whatever you do apart from action 2 so action 2 will have the highest probability now why does it not have one why does it have only 0.85 that depends upon your training you train very very well it will be one you train reasonable level it may be 0.85 or 0.9 it doesn't matter for the computer program as long as this number is bigger than all the other numbers in this action space meaning given a state there are 10 actions i can do if the best action has slightly higher number than anything else that much is sufficient for you you need not worry about whether this being 1 or 0 it should not ideally be 1 now why is it 0.85 that you need not worry now uh, reinforcement learning will make sure that after training the best action will have the highest reward that is all reinforcement learning will do and essentially reinforcement learning boils down to for any game for anything you tell me in rl my whole purpose is to train something like this some state action reward matrix like this or try to learn what are these numbers from the game that you give me you give me a game i will play and i will learn these numbers and then i will try to defeat you that is all rl is about then so what does it involve it will involve setting up an environment what is an environment in our case of uh, tic tac toe it is basically tic tac toe making a move evaluating who is winner is there any winner or not or also seeing what moves are possible and what moves are not possible meaning if your tic tac toe is from 1 comma 1 to 3 comma 3 you cannot place a cross in 4 comma 4 or 4 comma 1 4 comma 1 is outside your game 
so you cannot really place a cross there so that is how tic tac that is that is what it means uh, when we say say set up an environment the environment will say what is possible what is not possible and then the monte carlo simulation will explore different actions that are possible in each of the states so there is a state what is the action possible in that state if there are 10 actions possible monte carlo simulations will make sure that you learn all the time and you evaluate what is the reward for each of the time and we go to updating the matrix the matrix that we saw earlier we saw the state action reward matrix we will go on to update the update the matrix from the monte carlo simulation now now in the world of reinforcement learning there are two variants for the matrix it is not one single matrix that we always do there are two variants one variant is what we saw earlier given a state there are some actions i can take what is the best reward what is the action that will lead to the best reward this is called as the state action value function or the state action value matrix this is one kind one way in which we can formulate the rl problem the other variant of the matrix is simply the state and value matrix so i don't worry about actions let me summarize all the actions and say what is the best state to be in given that i am in state 1 from state 1 i can go to four or five states uh, what is the best state that i can be in i see a question mark from somebody any problem you can hear me or you can't see clearly or anything hello uh, can you hear me ma'am yes sir yes sir Okay. Uh, I yeah. I found out. Are we using this Monte Carlo for generating random state in this particular game, or are we using Monte Carlo to try to measure the probability that the state is having uh, giving reward or not? Ah, uh, ma'am, sorry, your voice is breaking. I think um, you type something in the chat window, right? Let me let me see the chat. Um, yeah. Ma'am, yeah, ma'am, your voice is breaking, ma'am. Please, can you type the query in the chat window? Yeah. Yeah, I am. Ma'am, type the question. i will read it up are we using monte carlo to generate random state or to find the state which gives the reward Ran monte carlo is being i mean in the case of tic tac toe we use monte carlo to generate a random action in a state madam so monte carlo is randomness so in any state we take, we pick a random action that is what we are doing and the random action will take it to some other state so once you take an action in a particular state you will go to a different state that is anyway known because if you come back to our uh, uh, come back to the uh, previous thing so the moment you take an action of pressing a cross here this becomes a new state it can be state k so monte carlo what it will do it will try to it will pick a random action in a state that's all it will do and once it picks a random action in the state we go and evaluate we will play the game we will continue the game and keep playing so that at the end of the game we know whether we won or lost so if you choose a series of actions in some states and you lost then the training will make sure that the the values or rewards for those states will state and action pair will be smaller compared to actions that will lead you to a winning state so monte carlo is used to pick random actions in a given state madam that is what it is uh, i hope that answers uh, ma'am's question okay fine so moving on so this is basically the very very basic introduction to rl rl is simply about training a matrix what matrix it is is your choice depends upon the game if the state if actions in each state are identical meaning that in each state i only have a choice simple choice of choosing one or two that action space is identical for all the states it is usually preferable to go with the state action value function meaning you take a state you have a set of actions you can do you try to learn the values but the actions if the actions differ by state in one state the actions are different from the actions in another state meaning that the moment let us say how does it differ it will differ in simple way so in this state you have self actions actions you have six cells so in state j you can choose from one of the six cells but the moment you put a cross and the other player puts a zero you can only choose from three more cells not not six anymore right so in that state the number of actions are not equal to the number of actions that are there in a different state so if that is the kind of scenario that you see you stick to the state value function so what matrix to use depends upon the game you can use any one and learn and win
but usually if there are too many actions in a given space which are varying from state to state then you stick to the state value function if the actions in all the states are identical you can go with state action value function this is what you can do but doing any one of them will not harm your model picking one versus the other will not really cause any detriment or any bad training if you train it very well any matrix is good enough there is nothing like one is better over the other it's about the complexity of storage that is the only thing that we are worried about now now if you go to what people have done in the real world or how do we learn and all so there are a few things that we need to look at the first concept maybe some of you may have heard it is what is called as a multi armed bandits multi armed bandits is a complicatedly looking name for a very simple uh, action that you do meaning there is a game which is let us say we think of three games the roulette or the these are called something i don't know what they are exactly called but uh, these are in the in the casinos they play this you pull the lever some number will show up and based on the lever you get an answer and there is a game of dice okay slot machine sorry this is called as a slot machine so slot machines are in casino people pull the lever on the right side the red color looking lever and some number shows up based on the number they get a reward and that in the game of dice if there is a single dice and if the game involved is you guessing the number i throw the dice you tell me a number if they match you win if they don't match you don't win or in the game of roulette you tell a number and the ball will fall somewhere it need not fall in five it can fall somewhere else this is what are single outcome games meaning you make a single call and there is a single outcome so that is very simply put a multi armed bandit problem is choosing a number to pick from a set of numbers if there is a dice that dice game that you are playing you you start to call out every time i roll the dice you call out one number very soon if you realize that some number has higher probability to win you will keep calling out that number that is called a multi armed bandit problem where you make n calls for single outcome games now how is it formalized formally it is like this given a certain amount of money at the start and the cost of each call or trial let us say it is all the gambling is not a good thing let us say we start with 100 rupees and every time you make a call you pay 1 rupee if you win you will get 5 rupees let us say this it is something like that now if i roll the dice and may and and hide the dice i will ask you whether you want to make a call or not if you want to make a call you should give me 1 rupee now if you win you will get 5 rupees let us say that is the game then you can only play 100 games right you cannot play infinite number of games you can play 100 games at most sorry at least now in between if you win you will get more money which which may lead to more and more uh, games that you play now so you start off with a certain amount of money and there is a cost for each call or trial and there is a reward if you do something you get a reward now let us say we are able to play 100 games now what do you do how do what is your strategy you will always call out random numbers or do you call out something else so what do you do after you start playing the game you see that some some numbers have more chance of occurring so that is called that is that is the concept of exploration versus exploitation meaning in the game of dice if you are just starting now i hide the dice i roll the dice and hide it you will randomly call any number between 1 to 6 let us say you want to give you uh, equal chance to everything you call 1 you call 2 you call 3 and you keep calling 1 2 3 in equal proportions but somewhere in between you realize after 5 or 10 or 15 games you realize that 3 is occurring more times this this dice is perhaps biased then you will start calling three most of the time that is called as exploitation whereas i don't know anything let me call out random numbers is called as exploration so reinforcement learning will do this exploration versus exploitation so this single call meaning i have n games to play each game has one outcome i can only do one call and this single call in a game with n n games to play is called as the k armed bandit problem meaning if it is 100 armed bandits you are playing 100 games very simply it is choosing between one of the k actions learning the expected mean reward for each action as the trials progress that is all it is you keep learning as the trials progress after 25 games you know very well that 3 is the k 3 is the most occurring number even though it is not occurring all the time 3 is the most occurring number compared to 1 2 4 5 6 what is the best bet you can keep betting for 3 even though if you lose two games you will win three games and you will get more money rather than calling everything randomly so this is the k armed bandit problem but then the other complication is not all games are single outcome not all games are dice games right so for other games with multiple actions before the outcome meaning that 
i need to do a series of actions before i know whether i will win or lose or you need to play multiple steps before you know you, you before you know if you will win or lose these are called as uh, slightly complex games with the delayed rewards one one action will not give a reward you will only know the reward at the end of the game so for this there are a few things that we will make that we'll assume about the board we'll assume that the board has markov property by markov property it simply means that the current state will retain all relevant information about the environment meaning by current state meaning if we go back a few slides this state so this current state meaning if there is a state j this will tell me all i need about the board and i need not worry about whether the human player put the zero first here or first zero was here that is irrelevant to me because that will in no way affect the outcome if the first zero was here instead of here will the outcome change no the board configuration looks like this i only need to know how the board looks like currently i don't need to know anything else and the markov process property also means that the current state will encapsulate all previous actions whatever you did previously will show up here nothing is lost so we assume that they have markov property on a chess board if you are if you are concerned in a particular configuration you know that some set of moves have come there which move came first which move came last is immaterial because you just need to win and the agent can make decisions based on this current state only i don't want the series of actions what did you do first what did you do second what did you do third all this i don't want i only want the current state that's all i am looking for so you show me the current state i will try to learn so this is the assumption that we make about the game if we don't make an assumption of markov process the game will become too complicated because even if the board is in the same state the same state can be arrived at in n different ways and those n different ways become increase the complexity of learning even more so so what is the mdp markov decision process is simply saying that there are states s0 s1 and so on there are actions a1 a2 a3 so on and there is what is called as a transition probability matrix given a state yes you take an action a what is the probability that go to a new new state s prime s to s prime you take an action that itself in the world and death outcome meaning that uh, the example that is most commonly given is about a robot there is a house cleaning robot that needs to go towards the wall charger the robot takes a step in the towards the wall charger there is a probability associated with the robot moving in that direction or some other direction so this transition probability matrix is an artifact of rl uh, initial stages so people thought in yes you take an action a you only have a probability of going to s prime and not definitely going to s prime that is a so this is an artifact may not really be of matter to us then there is a reward function you go to the state you get a reward what is the reward the reward is the value that you get by being in that state higher the reward it means that if you if you are in that state you have a higher probability of winning just like we calling out three most of the time when we know that the dice has more probability of getting three so and also the the, the game or the complement the, the game that we are coding for is a finite markov decision process meaning there are finite number of states and finite number of actions so that your matrix is finite if everything if some of if either one of them is unlimited you cannot really learn anything so majority rl tasks will fall into this finite markov decision process the only complexity is the number of states and actions like chess having more states than tic tac toe and go having more states than chess so the state space increasing is the only complication otherwise this is fine so once we know all this we will learn what is called as a policy policy is if you are in a particular state you take a particular action that is all the policy is about which will tell you given a particular state i am in this is the best action to take the policy is basically the learning of the reinforcement learning once you do the rl you will learn a policy which is essentially your state action reward matrix so if this is the state this is the best action to take which is what you will learn when you finally try now how do we do this maybe i will uh, uh, glean over them quickly just for the sake of uh, uh, completeness i have put them here if, if they look to be too much of math heavy we will skip some of the slides but basically what how do how do we formalize the learning i know that there is a program i know it will do random states and play but how do i do the random games how do i bring the random games into the matrix how do i learn the matrix learning the matrix is done using what is called as a bellman equation so bellman is the one who proposed this and it is basically what is called as the utility of the state sequence 
you are in a particular state what is the utility value of being there now what is utility value utility value is your chance of winning higher the utility higher is your chance of winning so utility is simply if you win sometimes that that reward is distributed among the states so that each state will have some reward and the higher the state with the higher reward has higher utility or higher chance of winning so if you are in a state s0 it has a reward associated with it and from s0 you can go to s1 from there you go to s2 from there you go to s3 and so on up to sn then the utility of being in state s0 is given by the reward of being in s0 plus a gamma into reward of being in s1 plus a gamma square into the reward of being in s2 and so on so what is this gamma gamma is what is called as discount factor or a discount parameter so let me just show up all of them so gamma is a discount factor between 0 and 1 what does it say what does gamma say gamma simply says that states which are very far away will lead to less of your utility value states which are close by will lead to higher utility value that is all gamma is about it is like saying you want to save say you want to save uh, in a simple example if you look at uh, ads that people give in lic and mutual funds no they will say become one become a uh, save one crore in five years you can always say i will save the one crore in the fifth year the four years let me enjoy whereas you can always say i will disciplinedly start saving from now so that i will save one crore by the end of five years so the immediate savings are this r of s not r of s1 r immediate things that you can do now in the near future and these are things that you can do very very much far away in the future they have very less utility value you may be able to do not be able to do by the time you go there so don't place your hopes on far away rewards use give higher weightage to the nearby rewards that is what the bellman sequence is all about sequence bellman equation now this can be formalized into this saying the expected value when there is a state st t goes from 0 to infinity you do gamma t into r of st this is basically the above equation in a condensed form now we can do one more simplification i know that the moment i i move out of st i go to different states neighboring states so you can simply express the utility value in terms of the neighbors so just look at this carefully u of s is the utility value of being in a state yes the moment i step out of state yes i go to other states they have their own utility values so my total utility value will simply be utility value of a state is the reward of being in the state plus a gamma into the maximum reward i get by going into any of the neighboring states if there are four neighboring states i can go to any of them the maximum i will pick up and that is an indication for me of the maximum reward i need not go into far future for everything i will link up my current state utility to the neighboring utilities this is what we use when we go to rl training we use some equation like this which says u of s is r of s plus gamma into maximum of the neighboring states that's all we do so this is the basic math behind the reinforcement learning and then this is uh, these are the terms that are explained r of s is basically the reward of being in the state s yes. you are in state s yes, this is the reward t of s a s prime is the transition probability of going to state s prime from s yes, given an action a as i said earlier it is a artifact of the world in days rl training today if you are in a state s yes, you want to go to state s prime you take an action you go there so there is no not much of Uh, effect of probability that we see in today's game because most of them are computer oriented in the computer you say add one the computer will add one it will not add two or three so that uncertainty is not there anymore then u of s prime is the utility value of state s prime so from s if i go to s prime u of s prime is the utility of value of state s prime and then if there are three or four s primes i can go into i will pick the one that gives me the maximum reward so i will pick max of the surrounding states which will give me the maximum reward and that time multiply with one discount factor because it is one step away and the utility value of being in state s yes, is r of s plus gamma into this that is all we have to do if you code for it properly we are done with the rl training not at with the environment but with the rl training then max of a is the max function which will take the highest reward gamma is the discount factor between 0 and 1 this is all we know now there are a few variants to the reinforcement learning problems i will briefly touch up on them much of math here but reinforcement learning games or reinforcement learning tasks can be categorized into three four types uh, there are various there are various categorizations what are those we will see
So episodic versus continuous tasks are episodic tasks are games that have an end state. Chess, like game of chess, after some n moves, the game will end. Tic tac toe will end after uh, three plus two five moves. After five moves, tic tac toe is likely to end. It will end at most after nine moves. So that is an episodic task. After all the players have made all the moves, after nine moves, you don't have anything there. So tic tac toe is over. Whereas there are some tasks like continuous tasks. So people have also thought of reinforcement learning for what is called as warehouse inventory management. In the in the business world, they have a warehouse. They have items of different types stored in the warehouse. Their incoming orders are not known. How many units of a particular item should I supply tomorrow is not known beforehand. And how much or how many units of each item should I place an order for is also not known beforehand. But you look at the past history, you can train a RL agent to manage a warehouse. So in such kinds of scenarios, there is no end state, meaning that the warehouse doesn't close or the problem is not over after one year. It keeps on going. It keeps going on. So this is a continuous task. Then there are two other. There is another distinction called model based versus model free. Now model based is basically even if you even before training the RL program, you say that in this state do this. If you already give it some directions to do, the computer agent will try to play that way, and it will try to learn whether what you said is making sense or not. If it is not making sense, it will update. That is called as a model based uh, RL. Whereas there is something else called as model free RL. I don't know anything about the game. start with a fresh mind and a fresh slate you you explore every state explore everything and learn that is called as model free now there is not much of real world distinction between the two if you are starting off on a new game you start as model free if you trained it for say 10000 hours you will get some understanding next if you are making improvements to the game you don't start as model free but you start as a model based with the q learning table or with the state action reward table that you already learned So instead of discarding all the past training, you say start from here, and we will see what will happen. Whether we will improve or whether we will do badly, that is called model based. So initially, all learning will start as model free, and once you are there in in between somewhere, it will become a model based training. Then there are two. There is another uh, distinction between how we update the state values. So if you saw the two matrices earlier, we either update the state action reward matrix. Or we update the state value matrix. Now, when do we update the matrix? Is the distinction between what you see now, Monte Carlo versus temporal differencing. Monte Carlo is you update the state values after each episode. You play the game fully. Once the game is over, that is when you will update the policy state values. That is called as Monte Carlo simulation. So this is useful in the case of episodic tasks, meaning the tasks have an end and there is a win or a lose, win or a loss. Then you can do Monte Carlo method to Learn policy or learn the policy or learn the state values after the after each episode. Whereas in continuous tasks like warehouse inventory, this is not possible. That is when we go to what is called as temporal differencing. Temporal differencing is you update the policy after each step. You are in a particular state, you take a particular action, you go to a new state. Then you update the value of your old state or old state and action. You update the value. That is called as temporal differencing. so it is simply like whether you update after every move or whether you update after the game is over that is the primary distinction between monte carlo versus td temporal differencing as it is called then then on policy off policy is simply like the model based and model free on policy is you already have a model then how do i learn that is when you use something like sarsa which is it will look up the previous model or previous policy and take actions based on the previous policy if there is no policy you are starting from scratch you do what is called as q learning i don't know anything the state action reward matrix is zeros for me i don't know anything you ignore the previous history then you do what is called as q learning q learning is an off policy algorithm meaning if you have a prior model you cannot use q learning if you don't have a prior model you cannot use sarsa because both of them will require different things from the state action value matrix then what are q values and values q value is simply the reward associated with an action in a particular state so there is a state there is an action the reward inside it is called as q value and if there is only a state then the reward associated with it is called as value so only state is there we call it value state and action are there we call it q value so q values will lead to a value for a particular state then the last thing that we need to know is exploration versus exploitation exploration is you do random actions because you don't know what the game is you do random actions and you try to see what will happen each time that is when you don't know anything about the game but even if you have even if you keep exploring till the end you may not really make 
most of the game or you may not really get rewards so after some time you will start to do what is called as exploitation exploitation is in a state s yes, take the action that is known to yield the highest reward so in the if i know that the dice is biased i will start calling three all the time that is called exploitation if i don't know anything about the dice i will keep calling 1 2 3 4 5 6 randomly that is exploration so any rl training starts with exploration you do some exploration and then after some time you go to exploitation how do we transition from exploration to exploitation that itself also has a logic or an understanding so how soon to exploit there are different approaches so the first one is called as the greedy algorithm what will the greedy algorithm do it will explore for the first k steps k can be 10 100000 if i am playing a game with 1 million steps first 1000 or first 10000 i will explore after that i will only exploit i will not do anything else i will always take the action that is known to yield the highest reward that is called as the greedy algorithm then there is something else called as epsilon greedy what is epsilon greedy epsilon greedy is a small variation it is simply this you generate a threshold you say the threshold is 0.4 some simply some number between 0 and 1 you generate a threshold then every time you want to take an action you generate a random number beta beta is a random number you generate now if beta is greater than uh, beta is greater than epsilon you will exploit beta is less than epsilon you will explore so this way exploration happens all throughout the game and not only during the initial part of the game so if you set e epsilon to be say 90 or 0.9 you will exploit 10% of the time you will explore 90% of the time if you set it the other way around if you set epsilon to be 0.1 you will exploit 90% of the time and you will explore 10% of the time but this 90 and 10 is not sorted in time explore explore exploration happens initially exploitation happens later is not there this can happen any time this is slightly better than the plain greedy algorithm then then people started thinking there is a constant fraction of exploration exploitation can we do something else so it is called as decaying epsilon greedy which is the third strategy which says after every n steps decrease the epsilon so initially you will start with an epsilon being 0.9 then you will do more of exploration because the random number you generate between 0 and 1 if epsilon is 0.9 90% chance that you will explore 10% chance that you will exploit now if you should you do this all the time no so after n steps you will decrease the epsilon let us say i make epsilon 0.9 to 0.81 i simply multiply 0.9 into 0.9 it becomes 0.81 now there is 20% exploitation and 80% exploration then after some n more steps i'll multiply it again it becomes 0.9 cube it becomes a smaller number this way we will keep decaying the epsilon so that we exploit most of the time as we go towards the end of the game and then regret is basically a simple function to formalize what is the good thing or what is the bad thing about these three strategies regret is saying if i have n steps and in each of these n steps if i know the optimal action if i take the optimal action in each step my total reward will be n into the reward but i have done some set of actions the the reward i got is sum of whatever i did the difference between these two is the regret so if you look at it you see that greedy has higher regret epsilon greedy has lower regret and decaying epsilon greedy the regret will decrease as you keep playing more and more the decaying epsilon greedy regret will decrease meaning you will get more rewards or the cumulative rewards will be higher when you choose decaying epsilon compared to choosing epsilon or epsilon greedy that is all it is about all that you need to understand from this slide is normally naturally choose the epsilon greedy or sorry decaying epsilon greedy algorithm no need to worry about should i do greedy or not choose the decaying epsilon greedy for your application then so what is decaying epsilon greedy i i just uh, mentioned it slightly the previous slide simple method you choose the initial value of epsilon every step i generate a random number beta beta is epsilon, greater than epsilon choose the best action in that state sorry which is uh, exploitation else you choose the random action which is exploration and after every epsilon, after every n step you decay the epsilon you do 0.0 and 0.95 into epsilon epsilon will start becoming a smaller and a smaller number then with this approach more exploration will happen initially and more exploitation will happen near the end of the training as you go towards the end of the training it becomes more of exploitation than exploration then 
what are this q learning is algorithm that i mentioned earlier q learning is off policy there is no policy involved and uh, by the way all this is available on this blog or there is a good book by uh, sutan there is a reinforcement learning book by sutan if you want to read i have mentioned the link somewhere i'll just share the ppt with all of you so what is q learning q learning will choose a small step size small epsilon initialize q for all the states and then it will arbitrarily set uh, it will it will do the it will start the training process now what is the training process it will initialize the state meaning given the configuration of the board what is the state that is what it will first pick up then loop for each step of the episode if the step if the episode has 100 steps for each step of the episode for a given state you choose an action and this action comes from your epsilon greedy algorithm if i am to exploit i will do something if i am to explore i will do something else that is what we are doing by choosing an action a then once you choose the action a observe the reward and the s prime what is reward and s prime reward is what you get by going to the uh, by uh, what reward is what you get by taking action a s prime is the state that you go to so from yes you take an action you go to s prime and then you get a reward now once you know all these you update the q learning table or the q table is called q table q learning table state action value table lot of names are there but you update it so it is simply q of sa is equal to q of sa plus alpha into reward plus gamma into max q value of s prime minus q value of sa so gamma into max q value of the new state minus q value of the current state this is the discounted reward that you get alpha into reward plus this discount and then that is updated to the q table so if you look at this this looks like iteratively improving a matrix right we are changing the same number again and again if we come there and the state will be updated to the new state s prime now once you once we are in the s once s becomes s prime we go back and repeat the process so essentially when we are in a particular state we take an action we see where we go based on where we go we give a reward or we give a penalty and then based on the reward or penalty we update the q table that is all we are trying to do when we do q learning now similarly there is something else so max the one one small uh, call out is max q of s prime a is the maximum reward possible in the next state meaning if you are in s prime from there you go somewhere else the maximum reward possible there is given by max a q of s prime a now sarsa is another of other thing which will to policy so you take an action a prime from s prime using the policy derived from q so you have a policy already with that policy you choose an action so initial action also is chosen from a policy so the only difference between q learning and sarsa is the action in a particular state comes from the policy in sarsa action in a particular state is randomly taken in the case of q learning this is the only major difference then as we go on so you see that the update matrix is slightly different if you look at the update also we see that for the q table there is a q of s prime a prime minus q of s comma a unlike here where this action itself is actually not a big deal in the case of q learning only in the case case of sarsa the action a prime you are going to take in s prime also will affect your final outcome so you learn a and you you choose s and a you update the matrix then you choose the s prime a prime as your new values of s and a to a beginner these are two variants not much to worry about not much to break our heads about these are two variants to training the rl algorithms i would suggest if you want to start start with q learning you can come to sarsa after you do a basic q learning you can come to sarsa then monte carlo is basically another approach and even here there are lot of nuances first visit monte carlo last visit second visit monte carlo some things are there where you don't really update the q value after every action if you look at it the two slides you saw earlier q learning slide and the sarsa slide the update to the q table happens inside the loop after every action there is an update to the q table that is what we see in the two things of sarsa as well as q learning but if you come to monte carlo there is no update to the q table inside the loop inside the loop all that you do is you keep generating series of states actions reward states actions reward and so on after all this is over then you go back and update your reward matrix or the state value matrix this is what you do when you go to monte carlo so there are nuances first visit versus uh, second visit and so on all that are really not required for us to be too much of worry right now and all this is there in this book reinforcement learning second edition by sutton and bartho this is a free pdf you can download from online if you go to google and search 
you will find all this so first visit versus every visit is excluding versus including the first visit every visit monte carlo says i will take the first visit also into consideration uh, whereas first visit will say exclude the first visit that's all the difference is about first visit and every visit now in summary what can we say we saw so many things we started with computer game and now we are stuck with the equations and q learning table what is it that i can take as a summary basically reinforcement learning is useful in situations where there are few variables that will affect the outcome meaning if you are playing a computer game only the two players will affect the outcome something else will not affect the outcome so why is this important very simply put let us imagine the scenario if you are playing a game of chess suddenly somebody hits the table and it falls down q learning cannot see that kind of a scenario only the player one or the player two will change the board state board state being changed because a cat jumped onto the chess board or the table fell down because somebody kicked it all that is not there okay then it is uh, uh, it is it has seen uh, reinforcement learning has seen more applications in computer games because it is more controlled environment meaning you want to turn right in the game you turn right in the game you want to turn left in the game you can turn left in the game so it is more controlled environment which is why most applications of rl have been in computer games people teach rl agents to play so that the game will appear to be realistic to you if every time you do some same action if you get the same reward you know that i come here and i will get the reward if you remember the mario game many of you might have seen it or played it played the mario game so there is a mushroom that will come in particular cell that is a pre programmed thing so all of us know that okay i should go and hit here so that i get a mushroom that is that is unrealistic because after some time you know the game very well you will win but in true real true rl game that will keep varying you hit the mushroom three times fourth time it will not show up because it not it knows that you are exploiting this thing so most applications of rl have been in computer games so far can i take it to any business application in the real world can i use it can i use rl somewhere what what do we think of it what do we think of it is this most business tasks where rl can be applied they can easily be solved by other modeling approaches meaning that there are other approaches of time series forecasting or other approaches of linear regression classification clustering to do the problem better with lesser computational resources then what is required to train a rl agent one simple example is the warehouse inventory management that i mentioned earlier if you are the owner of if you are the manager of the warehouse and you want to place an order to your manufacturing plant so that you will not run out of stock when your orders come tomorrow you have to deliver to the retailer so when retailers place an order with you tomorrow you should have enough stock so that you don't run out of stock so to do that today how much order will i place to the manufacturing plant that is a typical problem in warehouse inventory now i can try it using rl and learn i can also do simple forecasting methods i can forecast what will be the retailer demand in the next one week and based on that i will do all arithmetic if i know that incoming demand is 1000 units i have 200 units with me i will place an order for 800 units so that i will just match the incoming to outgoing if i want to have a safety stock i will place an order for 1000 more so that the incoming order is met by the 1000 and i have a 200 safety stock with me so simple policy of safety stock and all will solve the warehouse re inventory management problem without really needing a reinforcement learning agent so this is what we feel when we try to solve business problems rl is not really useful but people can use it to train computer games or if you want to teach somebody how to there are this uh, uh, virtual reality trainings not just games but virtual reality trainings where people are training craftsmen there is a carpenter there is a welder there is a uh, electrician you put a virtual reality uh, uh, i this thing to the virtual reality headset to them and simulate the reality meaning if it's a carpenter let us say you ask him to make a uh, uh, double cot bed and he is not really making the double cot bed there is only virtual reality headset on the top of him he will have the tools with the tools he will do some actions and then something will happen so in such kinds of trainings you make you can make use of rl to train and say you do this a game the cart will break you do this the cart will be good so it is mostly in simulated environments where real rl is finding out a good application or good use so thank you and i'll be willing to take any questions that are there and then we will move to the brief uh, hands on demonstration uh, any questions uh any queries on this from the participants side 
yeah i do understand it may be new to some of you but please don't mind even if it is a basic question please do ask not an issue okay then if there are no questions uh, we will go to the uh, hands on uh, uh, thing which is this so basically i hope you can see my screen uh, ma'am can you see my screen Yeah, yes, sir. It's okay. So last, uh, last okay, class. Yes, sir. Yeah. So last class uh, we saw uh, the coding in the environment of Google Colab. Now I am showing you a local environment. Now no specific reason. Local environment is Anaconda. You run Python on Anaconda. The result I am showing in a Ubuntu computer. Now what is this problem? It is basically crossing a maze. Okay, I see some question. Uh, somebody has typed in the chat window. Let me just go and uh, look at the question and come back. Okay, no, fine. Sir said you can see the window. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah. So, what is this problem? This problem is simply training an agent to cross a maze. What is a maze? If you scroll down, I have run it earlier. A maze is something like this. I hope you can see. Yes, is where you start, and E is where you end. A is the agent. Agent is the player. or we want to write a program that will cross the maze and what are these x's x's are blocks in the maze now if i say the x's will only stay here it will not go anywhere you will not really have good confidence in my program or the rl learning we will modify these x's as we go forward but i will tell you i will just go through the building blocks of the program run one scenario and see and then come back so basically the major or the most important thing is to set up the environment when you want to do any rl you want to set up the environment in this case i am writing a python class to set up the environment the class is called maze so maze you are initializing the maze maze is simply a 3 by 3 matrix of numbers two dimensional array x comma y where x goes from 0 to 3 default value is 4 meaning 0 1 2 0, and 0 1 2 size is 4 then the maze, we are setting up the maze then the starting point is set to be 0 comma 0 ending point is set to be 3 comma 3 if 3 comma 3 is the Uh, uh okay there is a small nuance here the indices either start from 1 1 2 3 3 0 0 2 2 so if you have 0 0 the ending will be 2 2 or 3 3 or whatever number it is so the maze starts at 2 0 0 the ending destination is at 5 comma 5 meaning if i say 5 ending is at 4 comma 4 which is when we start with zero index and the agent position is at the start the actions that the agent can take are four it can move north east south or west this is simple directions for us So if this is the board. The agent is here. Moving north is going up. East is to the right. South is below, and west is to the left. Agent can go any of those. These are the four actions that are permitted for the agent, which is basic initialization. Then set blocks is basically a function to set the blocks. You can set the blocks in any of the coordinate cells wherever you want to. It is. I, we will simply provide a list of tuples, list of x comma y pairs. We will set the blocks there. Then move is a function to move the agent. Agent will take a step. either towards give you give a step to the agent agent will try to move if the agent tries to move we try to update the state of the board that is all this is about if agent goes to if agent goes north the row will decrease because row increase downwards top row is zero bottom row is n so if agent goes north row will decrease agent goes south row will increase similarly agent goes east column will increase agent goes left column will decrease this is a simple calculation of to keep track of the cells then there is the reward so the reward is basically we are having a negative constant reward for any movement and if the reward if the agent is moving within the permitted list meaning if the agent is in the starting of if the agent is here let us say i hope you can see this agent is in the second row first position the if the agent says i want to move west moving west will move mean moving to the left which is moving out of the board that is not permitted agent will stay there if the agent says i want to move below agent can move below so if the agent makes a movement if the agent makes a movement within the permitted list if the new move if the new position is within the permitted list then there is a small reward associated with it if the move is outside the permitted list agent says i want to jump out of the board then there is a heavy penalty so when i say reward it is called it is called reward but there is a negative sign negative sign would simply mean penalty that is all it is so i am setting up if the agent takes a move for each move what is the final state and what is the reward that's why i will return i return the reward and i'll update the state of the agent after the move then this is a function to print the board this is nothing much to see in loops i have written a small code or got the code uh, 
from some other example where people print a board that's all it is to see a board like this to see the game then once you have all this there are two functions to return the state and the position you can set the position of the agent and then you can also set the state so very simply this is the environment we will go on to initialize the environment and see so shift the enter will run the cell like any other place like any other jupyter notebook shift to press enter will run so now what i am doing is i am starting a board initializing a board saying that board is this agent position is here if i do that so there is a board that is initialized and agent position is at 0 comma 0 i am setting block set 1 comma 1 2 comma 3 and 0 comma 3 i am setting block set 1 comma 1 2 comma 3 and 0 comma 3 these are the three places where i am setting block the indices start from 0 so this is 0 1 2 3 0 and 0 1 2 3 so 1 comma 1 is this 0 comma 3 is this and 2 comma 3 is this if we change any number we can always see that this will change so let us say i move the blocks to 1 comma 1 2 comma 3 and 4 3 comma 2 now see the you see the block has changed the 3 comma 2 block has come here okay so this is just to show that we are able to capture what is happening or we are able to set the board properly so there is a block now at 1 comma 1 0 comma 3 2 comma 3 and then i'm simply trying the trying to move the agent and seeing what is there in the board this is the set check so i have made a movement and said the, i said move the agent to south if i move the agent to south from the start this is where the agent has gone s is here a is here if you are not sure or if you want to see the move let us print the board before the agent moves now you see sorry other print is gone i think let me do this so you see the agent is at the starting and if i give another print after making a move i make the board to move to s and if i make a print board you see that the agent has come down so agent is moving based on our uh, uh, command you say go south agent is going south now to re to do the reinforcement learning i told you that yeah we need to set up the queue learning table so you set up the board of particular size now based on the board of the particular size you have to set up your queue learning table so you set the board size you set the action you set the number of actions and then based on action number of action and states you go and define your queue learning matrix queue learning matrix is simply the matrix of size and size and n action size and size are the rows and columns if there are four rows four columns it is 4 into 4 into and if there are four actions it will be 4 so 4 into 4 into 4 64 is what you will see okay so this is basically setting the queue learning table once you set the table you say q of 0 0 it initializes with 0 i did not do anything i just set it to this now let me do this let me train the agent now if you look at this i have trained the agent for two steps this is just a loop for i in range 2000 i repeatedly call this this is the algorithm that we are seeing the q learning algorithm is this given a given a particular state you choose a move you count the number of moves you take a reward for that move you get a reward and then you also get the new board state and based on the new state reward and the move you update your matrix that's all you are trying to do the q learning algorithm is the simple equation once you have written all the complicated code before now once you do this what happens what is the move counter move counter is simply to say how many times did my agent move north east west and south you see there is a fair balance it is not imbalanced it is also not exactly equal because it is a random process but it is a fairly a balanced kind of exploration all of it and after training if you look at the queue table this looks like this now what is the queue table each uh, mat each array in the queue table will correspond to one cell so the first array corresponds to cells 0 comma 0 so if you are in the first cell the actions are for take going north east south and west north has a very bad penalty or very high penalty similarly west has a high penalty you can move towards the east or you can move towards the south north east south west to understand that further you want you see the penalty of being in a cell somewhere here okay if you are in a cell, cell somewhere here you will see that moving east penalty is high now let me let me go back and and show you how will the agent move if i do this set of steps i set the blocks at 1 1 2 2 0 3 i have i am setting the blocks at the same place as 1 1 2 2 0 3 3 i am using an existing queue table i have already initialized the queue table i am using it and showing you how the board will move so we see some something printed out here nothing is clear here let me go back to the code 
this is the folder where it is and i hope you can see the image okay if you can see the image step 0 the agent is here now step 1 the agent has moved down so step 0 the agent is there step 1 the agent has moved below he has moved south because you can either move east or south he choose to prefer he chose the agent like you to receive that sir and then he is moving further south it is moving right जिम्मेदार So basically, what we saw is the agent learned to just to go south, go south, and then go to the east. This looks to be very simple configuration. Let me let us just make this slightly complicated. Instead of keeping the block here, I will do one thing. I will place the third block here at three comma three. So let us just go back and say the block is at three comma three. If the block is at three comma three, sorry, three comma zero, not three comma three. Yeah. If the block is at three comma zero, you will learn or you will see whether the agent will learn to just to follow some simple route or not. We'll try it again, and we will run the steps. And if you run and look at the new code now, sorry, let me just refresh. Okay, I just need to set the same block. Sorry, this is a small nuance in the code. Let me set the same blocks as I set while I am training. This is the queue table. Here I'll set the same blocks as I set while I am training, and then this is the. It took six steps to come to the answer. Let us go and look at how the steps look like. Now, if you look again, the cross has changed. The agent has been trying to deal with something like this. Now you see this. The agent is simply learning to go on the right side, right top corner. So this is another other variation. It means that the agent is learning to do something. If you think that the simple uh, putting things in the top corner, bottom corner doesn't make sense. we will move this x to somewhere here and see that is small iteration we will do we will put it at 0 comma 2 and see what happens so let us just go back and say the blocks are at 0 comma 2 and then say the blocks are at 0 comma 2 and see what happens if the blocks are like this what will the agent do that is what we want to see now you see this the new blocks have come up the agent goes south Goes south and turns to the right because you know he, the agent cannot go to the go to the bottom and then it is coming down and then going to the end. So this is a dynamic training that is happening on the fly. There is nothing that I did. I ran simple code and showed it to you. I hope this will convince you that this is a genuine RL implementation and give you some confidence to do this because I am not a native computer science guy. I learned it and did, which means most of you will find it very easy to do. A simple one-page Python code. I'll anyway share the code as well as the presentation with you after the talk. I'll be happy to take any questions. Uh, and thank you for listening to me, patient. Uh, any queries from the participant side? So please feel free to ask me anything else also. Maybe you would have seen a lot of. Uh, machine learning lectures over the course of one week. If there are any other doubts, also I can try to answer to the best of my ability. Any other topics or anything you want to ask, also please feel free to ask. Okay, uh, looks like there are no questions from them. Yeah, thank you yeah. very much. And, uh, yeah, okay, sir. Yeah, yeah. You can share my mail ID with the participants, and in case they have something, they can reach out to me also. Now. No problem. And uh, I will share the PPT as well as the code with you shortly. Python code and the PPT you can circulate it to the participants. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank yeah. you for that uh, wonderful, thought-provoking lecture on reinforcement learning. And uh, thank you so much, sir. You have clearly explained about uh, how computers started to defeat the human beings in games, and uh, you clearly explained about the Monte Carlo simulations, the multi-armed bandwidths. and uh, how uh, reinforcement learning is being performing the exploration as well as the exploitation process and the use of 
uh, mark out decision process and you explained about the difference between the Q learning and the SASA with the Bellman equation and the hands-on session also was very informative, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Golda, ma'am. Thank you, Vinay, ma'am, and uh, thank you, Durga, ma'am. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much for that uh, hands-on uh, hands session. It was very interesting. Very interesting. So dear participants, the uh, feedback link will be shared with you soon. I'll post it in the group so you can fill it in another half an hour. So the test will be open at 6 o'clock today, 6 p.m. today. So it will be open till 10 p.m. So those participants who have uh, more than 75% of the plus 75% uh, score will be receiving the certificate. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, thank sir. You, sir.